On August the 8th, 1943, the British Bomber Command began a series of nightly aerial attacks on Milan. Among the cultural treasures lost are the archives of Leon Cavallo's publishing house, Sonzogno, and the Teatro dal Verme, where Pagliacci was first performed. In light of the resulting scarcity of sources pertaining to the opera's compositional history, scholarship has relied almost exclusively on Leon Cavallo's Appunti, an incomplete, unpublished uh, biography, autobiography. The Appunti are without doubt the most important source for Leon Cavallo's biography through the composition of Pagliacci, and every biographer has relied on them almost exclusively. No Leon Cavallo scholar has, however, drawn on the most likely sources against which the Appunti could be verified, namely Sonsogno's letters to the composer held at the Fondo Leon Cavallo in Locarno. These and other letters, together with notifications in the press and eyewitness accounts, point to a history of Pagliacci that substantially differs from the one told in the Appunti. That Leon Cavallo would shape the narrative of Pagliacci to his advantage is understandable, but the Appunti have obscured, obscured our understanding of the opera's history with a harlequin costume of omissions and distortions. These include a series of intertwined topics ranging from Leon Cavallo's early dealings with Sonsogno to the sources for the libretto and the music and the performances planned for Paris. With his narrative of these topics, Leon Cavallo has attempted to protect his legacy, shaping a false impression of the opera's genesis and skewing the assessment of its provenance and historical position, claiming it was based on a real event and thus, take, and thus tying it to the Verismo movement more than the earliest reviewers were willing to acknowledge. The Appunti are especially misleading in acknowledging the source of Pagliacci of the Pagliacci libretto. Leon Cavallo claims that he was based on a, quote, tragedy that had engraved in blood the memories of my distant childhood, end quote. These memories refer to a crime of passion that took place late at night on March the 5th 1865 in Montalto, where Leon Cavallo's father served as district judge and led the trial. The, the documents chronicling the proceedings have been published in various degrees of completeness and tell the following story. Gaetano Scavello, a servant in his early 20s. So this, this is the story the documents tell. Gaetano Scavello, a servant in his early 20s, invited an unidentified woman to his place. She was at the time keeping company with Pasquale Esposito, servant of the brothers Giovanni and Luigi d'Alessandro, and seems to have declined the invitation. Scavello asked Esposito whether he was a go-between for, for Luigi d'Alessandro and the woman. Esposito responded that he was not, and yet Scavello attacked him with a stick. Esposito complained to his masters, who intercepted Scavello on his way home and threatened him with a whip. Scavello managed to escape, but the following day, four hours after sundown, as he was leaving the local theater, the D'Alessandro brothers stabbed him once in the arm and once in the stomach. Giovanni was apprehended the same night. Luigi fled, but eventually turned himself into the authorities at Cosenza. Scavello died at two in the morning. The connections between the court case and Leon Cavallo's libretto are tenuous at best. Carlo Nardi and 30 years later Matteo Sasso Sansone have thus pointed to a more likely source of inspiration. A series of plays and operas sparked by the publication in 1858 of the complete works of Antoine Girard called Tabarin, a 17th century comedian known for performing Commedia dell'arte like farces with his wife and selling quack drugs. One of these Tabarin inspired works Catul Mendes' 1887 one-act play La Femme de Tabarin has played a particularly significant role in the history of Pagliacci, for in August 1894, Mendes wrote to Leon Cavallo accusing him of having borrowed both his play from his play both topic and plot and demanding that the sources and play bill of Pagliacci read after La Femme de Tabarin by Monsieur Catul Mendes. This part of the story is reasonably well known. 
A month earlier, however, Sonsonio had alerted Leon Cavallo to Mendes's attempt to block performances of Pagliacci in Paris. Leon Cavallo responded to Sonsonio, stating that Pagliacci belongs to a tradition of related works that if he was guilty of borrowing, then Mendes himself might be guilty of having borrowed from Un Drama Nuevo, a play by Manuel Tamajo y Baus, known under the pen name of Joaquin Estebanes. What? Monsieur Mendes goes pretty far in declaring that Pagliacci is an imitation of his thumb that found the Tavarin. I had not known this book and only know it now because the accounts given in the daily papers. You will remember that at the time of the first performance of Pagliacci at Milan in 1892, several critics accused me of having taken the subject of my opera from the drama Nuevo of the, of the well-known Spanish writer Estebanes. What would Monsieur Mendes say if he were accused of having taken the plot of La Femme du Tabarin from the drama Nuevo? End of quote. Leon Cavallo goes on to reject the charge of having borrowed from the drama Nuevo. It is absolutely true that I knew at the time no more of the drama Nuevo than I know now of La Femme du Tabarin. I saw the first mentioned work in Rome represented by Novelli, six months after Pagliacci's first production in Milan." End of quote. Is it possible that the primary inspiration for Pagliacci was Un Drama Nuevo, a preview of the first performance of Pagliacci at the Teatro Malibran in Venice <coughs> on September the 7th, 1892, seems to suggest so, stating that, quote, the libretto of Pagliacci is obviously inspired by the great work of Estebanes, Il Drama Nuovo, End of quote. And about six months later, a preview of a performance at the Politiama Rossetti in Trieste confirmed that, quote, the plot is more or less that of the drama nuevo performed by Novelli at our Teatro Comunale. End of quote. Conrad Dryden has pursued the connection to some extent, claiming that Leon Cavallo, quote, borrowed heavily, end quote, from un drama nuevo. But Leon Cavallo could have borrowed from the play only if he had either read it or seen it in performance. An opportunity to see it would have presented itself when the company of Ermete Novelli reintroduced it to a Milanese audience on April the 10th, 1891, shortly before Leon Cavallo began work on Pagliacci. It appears, however, that Leon Cavallo was, at the time, in Bucharest, accompanying Anaclea Darkley on her Romanian tour. Furthermore, he could not have known the play from French or Italian editions because such editions did not exist. And yet, the connection with Un Drama Nuevo is worth pursuing, because Victor Morel, the original interpreter of Tonio, may have seen it before he began collaborating with Leon Cavallo on the prologue, a later addition to the opera. A manuscript copy of Un Drama Nuovo, as Novelli performed it, is held at the New York Public Library. It shows that Novelli adapted the original play, cutting sections, condensing others, moving yet others, and adding a scene each at the beginning of Acts 1 and 2. In the scene added at the beginning of Act 2, Novelli introduced a character not present in not present in Tanako Ibaus's version, the bouncer or Buta Fuori, who argues that acting is more difficult than writing, and then proceeds to the proofs of the scene, the juxtaposition of a famous comic actor's undisputed talent as a comedian with his puzzling attempt at a tragic role in the upcoming play. In a similar manner, after he had considered his opera to be complete, Leon Cavallo added a scene, the prologue, in which the author juxtaposes the old Commedia dell'arte place in which the tears were false with the upcoming ones, with the upcoming one in which the tears are real. Both scenes begin with the question, si può? in Pagliacci put by Tonio to the audience, asking permission to make a little speech, in Un Drama Nuovo put by the bouncer to the young lover, 
asking for permission to for his permission for himself to enter and the author for himself and the author to enter. Both scenes continue with the brief identification. The bouncers is I and the young author of the new drama, and Tonyos I am the prologue. Both scenes then culminate in describing the effect of the upcoming experiment. The comic actress's attempt at the tragic role will result in sonore risate, una tragedia da ridere, and Leon Cavallo's introduction of Commedia dell'arte actors who display real emotions will result in risate ciniche. It is not impossible that there is a connection between play and opera. Leon Cavallo claims having seen Un Drama Nuovo in Rome only a year after the premiere of Pagliacci, which would have been around November of 1892. But the only confirmable performance in Rome took place at the Teatro Valle about five months before the premiere, between Christmas of 1891 and the end of the year, that is shortly before Leon Cavallo and Morel began work on the prologue. It is unlikely that Leon Cavallo, who struggled financially and was busy completing or composing Pagliacci, would have traveled to Rome at the time. But Morel was singing Tell in Palermo in December of 1891 and Iago in Milan in February of 1892 and could certainly have stopped in Rome to see Un Drama Nuevo, Un Drama Nuovo, which at the time was causing such a sensation. More important, Morel claims that he played a major role in the conception of the prologue and consciously or subconsciously may have borrowed a few ideas. It seems to be common knowledge that Leon Cavallo added the prologue for Tonio upon Morel's request, but the scholarly literature has consistently failed to cite the source. The notion may have originated in an interview Morel, in an interview Morel gave in 1920 to Il Carroccio. In this interview, Morel claims that he suggested adding a prologue immediately after having heard Leon Cavallo perform the opera for him at the piano. He furthermore recalls having tried to stimulate Leon Cavallo's creativity by providing verses, vocal characterization, and staging, quickly converting Leon Cavallo from a skeptic to an enthusiast. The verses Morel claims he gave Leon Cavallo consisted of, quote, a dozen free verses, end quote, borrowed from a presentation he had given a couple of weeks earlier at a certain Albergo Continentale. In this presentation, he talked about, quote, the cruel moments in which the actor, the artist, can be placed before the audience, end of quote. Words that resonate not only with the bouncer's elevation of the actor over the author, but also with the fear that in the comic actress's most frightful scene, this is a quote, most frightful scene, the audience will erupt in loud laughter, end quote. The appunti are silent about Morel's contribution to the prologue, acknowledging only his continuous moral support and his role in pressuring the Teatro dal Verme into giving the opera's premiere. If Morel indeed contributed as much to the prologue as he claimed, then Leon Cavallo, concerned with authorship, did not want the world to know about it. In the end, it is clear that Pagliacci is not modeled on any source in any obvious way. Nevertheless, the accusations of having borrowed from Un Drama Nuovo and La Femme du Tavaran, led Leon Cavallo to insist in his appunti that the source of Pagliacci was a crime of passion he had re he remembered from his youth, presenting it as if it were the plot of Pagliacci, as follows. Here you're seeing the same slide again before to aid in the comparison. Scavello, Silvio in the opera, now falls in love with a member of an acting troupe, Netta in the opera, whose husband, Giovanni d'Alessandro, Canio in the opera, became suspicious and immediately after the fall of the curtain slit his wife's throat, washed his hands, changed his clothes, led Scavello, who was in the audience, to the barracks nearby and killed him with the same knife 
with which he had killed his wife. Leon Cavallo's efforts of justifying the originality of his libretto and of proving Mendes wrong went beyond his autobiographical writings, however. About a year after the successful premiere of Pagliacci in Milan, Sonsonio began to prepare a French edition of the vocal score, probably intended for performances in Paris, Bordeaux, and Brussels. Mendes saw them as the culmination of Leon Cavallo's copyright infringement and launched a campaign against it in the French press. Whereas Bordeaux and Brussels proceeded with their plans, Paris did not, surely a direct result of Mendes's campaign. In view of the damage that Leon, to, to, to Leon Cavallo's reputation Mendes had caused in Paris, Leon Cavallo seized every opportunity to repair it. First in 1899 at the Opera Comique, where the performance did not materialize, then in 1902 at the Théâtre de l'Opéra. For the premiere at the Opéra, Leon Cavallo concocted a connection between the plot of his opera and the crime of passion he ostensibly witnessed in Montalto, hoping to distract the critics from and the public from the controversy over the similarities between Pagliacci and the literary tradition to which the opera belongs. Leon Cavallo decided to commission drawings to be presented to the set and costume designers in Paris in order to, quote, create there a true reconstruction of my Montalto, of the true Calabria, exactly as I saw it at the time of my happy childhood between 1862 and 1868, end of quote. And thus prove to the Parisians and the world that Pagliacci grew from his personal recollection. He thus con contacted the mayor of Montalto on June the 9th, 1902, from the French Riviera, where he was working on the Roland von Berlin. Uh, what happened here? No. Quote, during the first two weeks of November, my Pagliacci will be given at the Paris Opera, the plot of which takes place in the Montalto that was my home as a child and that I still remember with great affection. On this occasion, I would like to have a staging of greatest truth in Paris, indeed a true reconstruction of the locations and the costumes of the village. Which is why I'm turning to your Lordship to have an exact reproduction of the Viale de la Madonna de la Serra, that is, the street that leads from the front of the church toward the fields, with the mountains in the background. Likewise, I would like to have a reproduction of the costumes of the male and female Calabrian peasants, as well as the women and men of San Benedetto, as I saw them around 1864-65 in Montalto. End of quote. Leon Cavallo then contacted a local painter, Rocco Ferrari, to do the work. Ferrari was confident that he could provide authentic depictions, even suggesting to quote, acquire for the chorus to some cone-shaped hats, stamped leather aprons, as they are still used by the female peasants. End quote. The costumes for the production by Charles Bianchini and an unknown collaborator survive at the Bibliothèque Musée de l'Opéra. Indeed, they seem to be based on Ferrari's drawings, as they include virtually all of the elements described in Leon Cavallo's correspondence. In contrast to the costumes, the set does not appear to have been based on Ferrari's drawings, but was borrowed from, quote, old repertoire. The fact that the opera reused an old set would indicate that the composer's interest in an authentic depiction of Montalto and its inhabitants was not shared by the Opera. The success of Pagliacci thrust Leon Cavallo into the debates about opera aesthetics occupying divided post-unification Italy and ranging from organic unity to national identity and the southern question. Pagliacci was not primarily discussed in the context of these issues, but in yet another one, Verismo, a diverse set of trends in painting, literature, and music, commonly associated today with the theories of Giovanni Verga and Luigi Capuana, but more often seen in the 19th century as a reaction against the conventions of Romanticism. Following the premiere at the Dal Verme, 
Amintore Galli, for instance, pointed to the Principi Verissi, and Eduard Hanslick, after the premiere in Vienna, saw in Pagliacci the influence of the Rismo. Not every critic saw this connection in such clear-cut terms, however. Fernand Gregg, for instance, did not fall for the ostensible depiction of Esquarto di Vita mentioned in the prologue. Quote, Pagliacci has the defect common to this genre of pieces in which there is a play within a play. The dramatic illusion is taken, so to speak, to the second power. There, the imitation of life is nothing but the imitation of an imitation, forcing us to remember that the actors, after all, are truly only actors. End of quote. Others refer to conventions in the libretto. In the aftermath of the premiere, Sonsonio told Leon Cavallo in a letter that, the, quote, the characters speak a language and demonstrate sentiments superior to their local, to their social standing. End of quote. Sonsonio was by no means alone with his view. Amintore Galli pointed to this very problem in an overall post-positive review when he wrote that Tonio expresses himself to Netta in a manner too aristocratic for his standing. Or that, quote, Maestro Leon Cavallo profoundly feels the musical romanticism of a Schumann and Guno and the idealism of a Brahms and his subjective and psychological tendency frequently manifests itself in Pagliacci, especially in the love duet between Silvio and Meta. End of quote. It has been said that Leon Cavallo disliked the term Verismo, but in the context of Pagliacci's critical association with this movement, he may have felt the need to tighten the connection by distorting the facts. The connection between the opera's plot with the rich tradition of Cabaran works had clearly become a problem, not only because some critics detected plagiarism, but also because the subject was conventional and thus did not truly represent Leon Cavallo's real-life memory, on which it was ostensibly based. And whether or not Leon Cavallo knew about the connections between Pagliate Prologue and Ermete Novelli's adaptation of Un Dramma Nuovo, Dramma Nuevo, its discovery would, in light of Morel's input, have raised the further issue of a previously unacknowledged collaborator. In short, Leon Cavallo saw his legacy under attack and took every opportunity afforded him to defend it, not least by cloaking the opera's true genesis in the commedia of his ability.